the talented 3D artist. Hey everyone, Kyle Hamrick here, and welcome to this special spooktacular Ghoul of Motion live stream. I'm really excited about today's guest. He's a talented 3D artist with a love for amusement parks, horror, and working those things into his fairly prolific output of personal projects. In addition to being one of our talented School of Motion teaching assistants, he's also created tutorials for us as well as independently. He presented this year's SIGGRAPH and he's even worked on a project with Beeple. Please help me welcome Luis Miranda. Hey Luis. Okay, for real this time. A uh, little bit of a false start, but hey, <laughs> here we are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how's it going? Pretty good. Just, you know, getting ready for Halloween tomorrow. So. Pretty excited. Good. Uh, maybe, maybe in the spirit of my messed up intro, uh, we'll just say everything twice here, and then it'll feel totally normal. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm not trusting YouTube very much uh, after it's been unkind to me a few times in a row here. So <laughs> I think I jumped the gun on restarting it. Um, okay, so thanks so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I'm really excited to have Luis here. Like I said. Uh, twice. And <laughs> obviously, uh, as you've seen by the smoothest production ever, uh, this is obviously live streaming right now. So uh, I see a bunch of you in the chat already. Um, I see uh, you've got uh, clearly a sizable Denver contingent uh, cheering for you already. <laughs> Um, nice. But obviously, ask us your questions. Let us know what you want us to talk about. Um, we've got some cool stuff coming up, but uh, we want to know what you want to hear too. So um, so uh, first off, Luis, for the people who don't already know who you are, you want to just kind of give us a quick bio, kind of let us know um, where you came from, what you do, uh, what your background is, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I started um, motion design kind of first I went to like film school. Then I went to uh, this a local TV station, uh, Telemundo, right? And it's all in Spanish. And so I kind of used that opportunity to learn more motion design, Cinema 4D and stuff. And eventually that kind of got me a, another job at a different place, uh, but they did a show for the Broncos. And so through them, I was able to get connected with uh, the producer of the Broncos. And he then started contracting me while also working there. And eventually they just hired me full time. Uh, I did that for three years. Then I decided to go freelance. Uh, around that time I was when I kind of got involved with uh, School of Motion, uh, both by taking courses, but also eventually becoming a TA. And then from there, just been kind of doing a lot of freelance, uh, trying to figure out like, you know, how to balance work with life, whatever, and trying to have the most fun with it. So, yeah. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's been really cool watching your uh, career. Just the, you know, I've, I've known you for a, a couple of years now, um, just kind of through like, uh, you know, the School of Motion group at first. But um, I know we got to meet uh, last, like early last year, I think, in Orlando. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know, it just feels like your career has kind of been doing that uh, recently. Um, you. You've been working on all kinds of cool stuff. You got a, you got a fairly new reel out. Um, you got some really cool projects under your belt lately. And uh, it's just really awesome to see. And um, so hopefully uh, you'll have some, some insightful things to say that I'm sure will be so inspiring to a bunch of people, right? Yeah, <laughs> no hopefully. pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cool. So uh, I, I actually used to do a decent amount of uh, sports graphics, too. Uh, I never worked for a team directly, but um, so I know that fun. Uh, mine was baseball, so it was lots of versioning uh, mm -hmm. after, you know, getting to make something cool. And then you get to make like 35 versions of it. Yeah, <laughs> there's the ways to automate it. I found um, there's the, there are now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found that there's an Excel spreadsheet that if you fill it out and kind of type in certain uh, things in your comps, it'll create as many comps as column or rows as you have, and it'll fill in all the information from column. And that was a great way to automate a lot of like the lower thirds. But yeah, it's still a pain in, to <laughs> to have to render all of those. But yeah, yeah, uh, I would I would give anything to have had master properties back then. Yeah. Don't know. Um, but yeah, like I don't know. When I started sports, I, I remember thinking that it was like the coolest thing ever. Um, going like, oh, all these really cool graphics. And this is before I kind of learned about like what um, music visuals were. Mm -hmm. uh, so before like finding out about Beeple and all them. 
Uh, and so I remember when I was like doing some sports stuff and then finding Beeple and I remember just going like, what is this thing in particular? And so I kind of got me interested in the whole like realm of doing like weird octane stuff and exploring uh, 3D more of a like artistic side, more abstract rather than kind of like uh, packaging for like uh, TV and sports mm -hmm. and stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's uh, I was actually just kind of about to ask like how you got into, you know, how you sort of took that turn. Um, uh, and that's, that's really cool. Like uh, it, it's interesting to hear like what, um, you know, for some people there's like one specific thing that they see that was kind of uh, like, oh, wow, this can be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my way back in the day, I saw some, uh, a friend of mine showed me some stuff from NK12. Um, mm -hmm. This was like 2004. So <laughs> right when they were first a thing and when motion design was kind of motion graphics at the time was kind of first mm -hmm. a thing. And um, it's cool being able to trace stuff back to like one or two videos you saw that like, oh, wow, this is a thing that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. and you just lean into it and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you've, uh, speaking of like leaning into things and, and being freelance, which, um, I want to kind of talk about, uh, uh, freelancing stuff maybe a little bit later, but, um, I want to talk about some of these personal projects, uh, cause it, at least from sort of an external observer, it seems like you've just like leaned way into doing stuff that's fun for you. Um, and making those into personal projects. Um, yeah. uh, if if you haven't check out, checked out uh, Luis's um, Instagram, uh, he's got a ton of awesome stuff there, but uh, you'll definitely see a theme emerge pretty quickly, which is that he's got all this horror stuff. Um, recently, you've been doing a bunch of uh, Five Nights at Freddy's stuff. Uh, you've got a bunch of uh, Doom stuff. Um, and then if you go back further, um, earlier, like at was it early this year you were a bunch of doing a bunch of this like black and white gothic horror stuff oh. that was really fun um just all kinds of video game references and stuff like that too it's uh it's just cool to you know see you really leaning into the stuff that you want to do mm -hmm. um and uh i mean we're going to talk about that in a bit but uh, you know I, I i think a lot of people would be really curious to see like um i don't know what what are your thoughts about that and you know how much you uh, feel like that pays off in, in terms of a career. Yeah, I would say that uh, the reason I did it um, is because I feel like when we first start doing motion design, we kind of try to do the things that are really cool at the time. So mm -hmm. we'll look at stuff like Buck or, you know, even the stuff that um, like the mill and man vs. machine do with like the really cool sort of abstract thing. And uh, you kind of like try to emulate that. Uh, and I found myself doing that a lot early on, trying to do like these styles that weren't necessarily what I do. Uh, so I found myself doing like kind of cutesy il um, illustrator sort of style vector things. And, you know, it looked fine, but it was just like not as good as somebody who does it every single day. Mm -hmm. And so at some point I just said, you know, I should just kind of like do the thing that I really want to do because I find myself really uh, drawn to it and also I find that I'm a lot better at it for some reason like out of everything This is something that comes to me naturally um, And so I kind of decided to just go that route and Kind of just do the things that I like and even if they don't bring me money because I think that's also another thing that people do is they'll try to do a certain style so that uh, people will notice them and hire them um, Because then they they can say oh I can do that particular style, but uh, what the thing that I found was happening is that people were hiring me to do projects of those styles, but I wasn't as necessarily a big fan of those styles. And mm -hmm. so I kept doing a lot of work that I didn't want to do. And so by leaning into kind of like the horror and kind of like the more cinematic stuff, I'm now able to work on more uh, projects that kind of cater to my skill set. So, I mean, man, you kind of just summed it up like perfectly there, right? Um, it's, uh, I know Ryan Summers is real big on this, uh, you know, putting this out there and a lot of other people that like talk about demo reels and, and, you know, people that have spent a lot of time hiring other people, um, make a point, like put the work on your reel and on your portfolio. That's what you want to be doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, not necessarily what you've done. Um, and then you'll get hired to do that stuff that you want to do. And as you, as you, you know, eloquently put it there at like, you're probably going to enjoy it a lot more and be way more into it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you're not just like, I don't know, making shiny ball renders every day or whatever. Yeah. 
yeah. mobile as <laughs> mobile. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, I definitely would ahead. recommend to everybody that if there's something that you kind of, uh, really gravitate towards. Um, cause like I've always been into horror. Like, uh, my mom used to tell the story where we went to like a store and she said, go grab one toy and that's all you're going to get. And I would always come back with like the scariest looking toy. <laughs> and, and so I was just like, I, this is something that I kind of just, I, I just know how to do and I really enjoy doing it. And I think, um, you know, there's a couple of renders that I did. I was just like, why, why does, why does everything I do in 3d that like I aim to be scary turn out to be like really scary? Like, what is it about that? And so I just kind of felt like I'm just going to keep doing it and have fun with it. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I would bet some of these people would love to uh, maybe get some insights into some of your uh, process and workflow and stuff like that. I know you have a little demo ready for us. So um, should we maybe dive into that for a little bit? And uh, I'll again remind people, if you have any specific questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'll uh, either address them as they come up or when they become relevant. So um but uh, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and uh, pull up your screen. And um, just a disclaimer, I am super weak at 3D too. So uh, if you explain it to me like I'm an idiot, that's probably perfect for any new to 3D people who are watching. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So let me, All right. Uh, I've got you up here. All right. So you guys oh. can see the animation. Let me actually pull up the finished video so you cool. guys can see it. <clears throat> so it's this guy. Um, this one's probably one of my more like popular anime. Like it's actually the most popular thing I've made. I don't know. Like you guys are gonna go get really annoyed at how simple this thing is, but for some reason it just I don't know kind of took a life of its own. Uh, so here's the original project file. So I just want to break it down really quick. Um, so if you notice, there's only three lights in the scene, and just like some balls in here, and the ball simulation doesn't really require anything insane it's it's honestly just like all default settings so here let me uh, actually go ahead and grab uh both the the cloner and the cube copy it let me create a new and drop it in okay so here's kind of how my cloner looked before i uh simulated it so let me go ahead and go to here quick shading cool so i just made a lot of balls and told it to be dynamic and told the uh, cube to be rigid so that it can capture all of them. So let me go ahead and activate this guy. So we're and still you... kind of playing mobile here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then, yeah, I just simulate it, let it kind of do its thing. And then what I do is go over here to uh, collision, or actually here in dynamics, and I hit set initial state. And so it kind of freezes it in that position. Oh, it used to. Let me see. <laughs> Actually, me... except when you're live, yeah, then yeah, yeah. then nothing works. <laughs> All right, let me let me do it again. Let's see if it does it. And then set initial state. Ah, ah no. Okay. Well, another thing that I like to do is go here to my timeline. I actually do negative time, so I'll do something like negative sixty. And I always start at zero for my animation. So mm -hmm. if you switch back to this guy, uh, all of his animations are started at sixty. But when you go back, you see that it simulates for 60 frames mm -hmm. and then it kind of settles. And then around zero is when the animation starts and he starts moving and starts, uh, you know, <laughs> ruffling the balls. And you can't render negative frames. So even if you hit render and you have your timeline set over here, it will simulate it first and then it'll start at zero. And so right. it's, a, it's a great way to simulate something without. Uh, because yeah, you kind of have to like press play for a while. Uh, so if you give yourself negative time, it kind of just does it all in the back end, And then by the time the actual frames start rendering, it's all ready to go. Mm -hmm. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and just simulate these guys. But yeah, it's super simple. I, I literally just left all the default settings on. Um, so yeah, I didn't like, I didn't really adjust anything. Um, and it just simulated pretty quickly. Once it's down here, he starts moving up. He has its own tag um here on the body and he just stands up and moves it and uh that's pretty much it so it was pretty mm -hmm. simple and uh so uh, i know i already know the answer to this question but did you create this model of the character yourself oh no no uh this guy is actually was provided uh so something about the five nuts uh at 
Five Nights at Freddy's community is that they there's a very prolific fan art scene. And so if somebody makes a really cool uh, model, they will actually usually provide it for free. And so I found this guy uh, from this guy named uh, Spring Greg, I believe his name is. Let me see if I can pull him up. And yeah, he, he does all like a lot of really cool, let me see. Yeah, so he does a lot of like models based on Five Nights at Freddy's. And then cool. he just releases them for free on DeviantArt. And, awesome. and he also does like Cinema 4D versions. So if I go into my content browser, it's already installed. And so they're all here. I just drag them in and it creates this thing for me. And all I have to do is just drag it in and it creates the model. So once it loads in, it's going to be really huge. But <laughs> yeah, so. are, are you having to rig these yourself or they're uh, pre-rigged as well? Oh, yeah, they're, they're all rigged as well. Uh, if awesome. you like bust them open, you can see that they have their own hierarchy. They even have like little controls so that you can control the head and stuff. Awesome. It, yeah, it's uh, it's really convenient. It, all I had to do was just animate the head, the ears, and also the eyes. But the eyes are actually kind of cheated in that I have this thing called a constraint tag. Mm -hmm. And what it does is that I set it to look at something. And so I just tell it to look at the camera at all times. So if you kind of step through the animation, uh, his eyes are like locked onto the camera. Uh-huh. And that's just to kind of add a little bit more creepiness, you know, just <laughs> if you're being watched, you know, it's kind of just really weird. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, I, I think I, I really like that um, kind of note, too, of like, you know, a lot of people feel like uh, using stock elements or uh, in this case, you know, models that someone else created that, you know, they sort of feel like that's cheating or something. But um I mean, it's really just a smart use of your resources. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're doing personal projects for fun, like, um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah. So I would say that, um, you know, there's a there's the term kit bashing. And it, it's a thing that's been around for a really long time. Even before 3D, people used to grab um, models of, like, cars and stuff. And then they would bash them together and make something new. And so the creativity doesn't come from you know like oh i stole this thing it's from how you combine these elements together and tell your story so if you're not a modeler and you don't know how to make buildings or you know this creepy guy for example uh you can spend you know an entire month trying to make it uh but in that month you could literally produce like a ton of personal work that could uh get you recognized and also get you work so it's really about like what are you trying to accomplish like if you want to be a modeler and you want to, you know, like that's the thing you want to focus on, then yeah, modeling all of the stuff yourself is a great way to practice. But if you're more of a, you know, just trying to tell a story, uh, you want people more to focus on your ability to like light render, uh, camera moves and stuff, it doesn't really make much sense to model every little thing. So that's yeah. what I would say. <laughs> yeah, I think well said, like um, figuring out what, what it is you're aiming for. And, uh, you know, if, if you have fun modeling everything absolutely from scratch or illustrating everything from scratch or whatever. Cool. Go for it. Uh, but don't feel like you need to just because you're doing it yourself, like, mm -hmm. uh, credit appropriately and, uh, <laughs> move on with your life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time I post anything that uses, um, elements from somebody else, I always credit everybody. Like, this is who I got this from. And so when people go like, did you model this? I'm like, no, it's, it says right there that I didn't, um, you know, and I, I think that it kind of it's almost like a collaborative project mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. you know you're doing you have the vision but then you're grabbing elements that other people have provided and maybe they made it uh, with the intention of you know just giving it away to whoever but then they sh that thing just happens to manifest itself in your project and now you somehow were able to work together across space and time you know it was, it's kind <laughs> of a weird thing but them doing that work for you. Uh, and then helps you produce a much better product at the end. Like mm -hmm. that's, I don't know, it saves you a ton of time and it just makes you, you combine the strengths of other people and combine it with your own, so. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I was going to make the comparison. Like I'm an okay visual designer. I'm a much better like animator and, uh, you know, all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the projects where I have had someone else make the designs for me and then I make it move, I feel like they're a million times better. And it's, yeah. it's the same thing. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, it's a good excuse to collaborate with people and maybe like um 
you know, in some instances, you know, maybe that person comes with a built in audience as well. And so it's just good to get it seen more by, you know, on both sides, too. <laughs> yeah, like, um, yeah, it's just working with somebody who's more popular than you, obviously, gets more people to look at your stuff. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, but also you can also do it the other way where uh, if you have a friend who's really talented at something, but maybe they're just starting out. Uh, that's a great way to collaborate. Um, there's this guy, his name is uh, Trevor Welch. Um, he's, he's been getting into Houdini um, and he like did a hundred day challenge where he was trying to make art every day. And he started posting some stuff about like liquid. And so I was like, hey, I have this thing. I like, I really suck at liquid simulations. Would you be able to help me out? And so it was the recreation of that death scene from um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street where the liquid mm -hmm. goes up from the bed and so i modeled I mean, sorry I, I like designed the entire set put all the bed and like did everything and then i just sent them the scene and i said like i just needed to go up man <laughs> and then he like did his houdini magic and just created this really awesome simulation and sent me the file and i just was able to plug it in get some uh give it like a nice little texture and yeah it was pretty much done and i was just like he saved me so much time and like made this thing look so much better than what i would have came up on my own so <laughs> I feel like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, since I'm not a, a 3D person really, but it feels like in the world of, of 3D, it's maybe a little little easier to like put your, uh, I don't know, that, that ego piece aside and realize that like it's so, so much harder for one person to do all those things. And so, you know, it's, it's maybe a little easier to be like, well, I'm a lighting specialist or a texture specialist or something and think about collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty of people that still try to do absolutely everything themselves, but um, I don't know, maybe just because there's so much involved. Yeah, there's some, uh, you know, I'm sh uh, there's one person, his name is um, Aaron Coverett. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of him. He pretty much does everything in his scene. Um, but when you look at his, he's produced like two really awesome images and everything in there was like modeled by him or, you know, I'm pretty sure it was all modeled. And so like he, he takes it to the extreme, but like that's just kind of his thing. And so he, it's also really cool seeing like his process where he shows individual elements and he's like, yeah, this thing was done this way. And he like breaks down and talks about how, uh, he does like, um, a photo scanning or uh, I forget what that word is, but he just takes a bunch of photos and then creates a 3D model. Then he cleans cool. it up and then paints it. It's like super cool stuff. Awesome. Um, so let's let's dig into this personal projects, uh, just sort of you know overall thing. Um, uh, I, I was looking at the credits for your reel, uh, which uh, I believe we have a, a link that we can drop in the chat. So uh, you did work for The Mill, Beeple, Oculus, Denver Broncos, and then it's self-motivated, 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 and self-motivated. By the way, try saying those. That was really hard. Um, but I just want to point out like how much of your reel is personal projects you made. That's kind of amazing. Um, did you... Uh, I mean, did you have a, just a big enough backlog? Did you make some of these specifically to like round out your reel? Or um, I know you've been doing a lot of these personal projects. I didn't check how often you're putting them out, but I know mm. it's pretty frequently. Mm. Uh, so what I did, um, so when I was going to be presenting for SIGGRAPH, uh, you know, they, it's customary to show your reel and all that. Mm -hmm. So I want... I had a reel, but I just didn't think it was representative of the stuff that I was doing. So mm -hmm. what I did was I went uh, into my everydays that I was doing because uh, earlier in the year or actually last year, around November, uh, uh, Beeple was in town and mm -hmm. I was at the bar with him and and just everybody was just chatting. And then he was like, why aren't you doing everydays? And I was like, I, I did do them for a little bit. He's like, do them again. I was like. <laughs> okay and he's like i challenge you he's like just do 100 of them and that's it and i was just like a okay. hundred <laughs> i was like okay that's just like three months whatever and so i started doing them and i found like a really good rhythm where i was making uh some pretty cool images and it carried me into the into this year and so when it was time to start working on my realized i, I kind of went through those uh, old project files mm -hmm. And I was testing out a lot of like different um, techniques, like um, matte painting and stuff, like in 3D. Uh, and so I realized that doing those like matte painting style, um, they actually translate really easily to video. So there's one with um, uh, Cinderella's Castle, and that one I mm -hmm. kind of just 
designed it and then kind of like in Photoshop threw in like a background, like some clouds, whatever. Uh, but then when I animated it, I kind of pretty much did the same thing, but it was an After Effects. I just brought in the camera and I just gave it like a nice little background with the clouds. And it just, I don't know, translated very seamless. So I was like, well, this is encouraging. So I started grabbing more of them and started animating them. And uh, yeah, then I just kind of threw them into my reel and had like 20 people just like tear it apart and tell me like how to improve it. And then at the end of it, I think uh, I came out with a pretty good reel. <laughs> well, I think so too. I, I actually, uh, I think I saw the earlier version um, from... Uh, I don't remember if it was from you or from one of the people that was talking to you, uh, like talking you through it. But um, it was it was a big change uh, between those two uh, as it kind of got tightened up and, um, you know, made really awesome. That's <laughs> yeah, a it's a great point too. like having other people uh, give you feedback on your reel. Probably, you know, don't just reach out to one person that you idolize or something, but get get some opinions of a couple people that know what they're doing. You know, your mom's going to love it either way. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, some people even, I flirted with the idea of having someone else cut my reel, mm. uh, which would be good cause maybe I'd actually have a reel then, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's easy to get too precious about your own stuff probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like some of the things that I would have lingered on or like cut it or like cut it shorter. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, they gave me some cool advice, like, um, matching cuts and stuff. So there's one where it shows the side of a girl's face. And then I cut to this guy doing a similar motion and it mm -hmm. kind of feels like they're in the same sort of universe uh, because they're both kind of sci-fi-ish. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great way to sort of, I don't know, it gives it more impact, I guess, by doing that sort of like match cutting and uh, grouping them in uh, sections that make sense to go mm -hmm. together. So mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, we kind of have one very obvious answer here, but... Uh, what do you feel like doing all these personal projects um, and cranking out every day? So did you do all 100 every day? Or did you keep yeah. going beyond that? I did well, 30 and I feel like it about killed me. <laughs> uh, well, like I actually started doing every day in 2016. Um, oh, okay. Wow. So I did that mm -hmm. for about three years, I believe. Um, I didn't do like the full 365. Like um, there was a few days where, you know, obviously I missed. Uh, Almost every day. Yeah. So... At the end of those three years, I had close to 800 renders, and, and I was just like, yeah, that was a lot of stuff. But like the thing that I, the reason that motivated me to do it, uh, first it was like, that was around the time that I discovered Beeple. And then mm -hmm. once I started doing it, I realized like, you know, your skills like progress a lot faster and you yeah. see like what your first one is. And then even on the third day, I made like some big realization. I was like, oh my God, like th this is a, a cool thing that I just learned. And then you just keep uh, building on it. And eventually, by the end of it, you're like way better than where you started. And mm -hmm. so I was like, let's keep it going. And so I just kept doing it. And yeah. So I've got a very relevant question here wondering about how long you spend every day working on that stuff. Okay. Uh, I usually do them in the evenings. Um, so if it's just a still, that takes me about like two hours um, to to do the whole thing, uh, light it, render. Uh, and then I spend a pretty good amount of time in compositing. I like to, I have kind of my own little setup where I have all my layers broken up and uh, I know exactly what passes I need uh, to like, uh, to make the thing work. And so then I bring those, those in and I composite. I use a lot of like um, magic bullet uh, looks. Mm -hmm. And so I just uh, have my little templates and stuff and it's just kind of play around with them, try to boost them up as much as I can. And then I, yeah, I just posted it. And so I would say I spend like a third of my time on the compositing and then the other two thirds on the rendering part. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that, I mean, that's obviously a, you know, a not insignificant amount of time every day that you're, that you're spending on unpaid work. Um, so how do you, how do you balance that out with, you know, real jobs that are coming in? Uh, yeah. So uh, the way I work is I'll do like, some projects uh, kind of grouped uh, within a very close uh, amount of time together. And so that will then pay me enough to where I can uh, go uh, several months without having to work. And in those times, that's when I spend, you know, learning, uh, doing tutorials, stuff like that. Uh, if I have more work coming in, and then obviously I'll just keep like expanding, extending it. But there's always those uh, times throughout the year where work just doesn't come in because mm -hmm. clients don't need it or whatever. 
And so I just take that opportunity to try to, you know, find something new to learn. Uh, the thing that I, motivates me to do it is uh, I'll try to find series. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll find something that I like or something that does well. And then I go, all right, well, I'm going to fill my grid with that on Instagram. So I'll do nine of them. And then at the end of that, I'll be like, all right, well, I guess that's done. Let's see what else I can learn. And there's usually, and the reason for that is that uh, you kind of make each one in a very similar fashion. Mm -hmm. So if you have a certain workflow, it kind of reinforces it. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, the Doom ones, I, I learned this technique where you can actually grab models from video games. Uh, people go in, kind of extract them, and put them as this really strange file. Uh, but Blender has an ability to convert it. So then I convert it, which lets me save it as an FBX. And it has all the rigging in it. So I'm able to pose them however I want. And once I do that, it also comes with textures and UVs, which allows me to paint them in Substance Painter and give it like really cool textures. And then I send it all to, to Redshift. And then I start like lighting in and posing. And then it gives you this like really cool image. And so I was like, oh, this is a cool workflow. Let me just keep doing it. And right. so I did it for, you know, like 12 renders in a row. And so I like that process is now hardwired <laughs> and I know exactly <laughs> what I need to do to do it. Yeah. Well, that, that, I think that's really smart. Um, yeah, uh, kind of you're not reinventing the wheel every single day. You're you're kind of figuring it out once and then doing variations on a theme um, to kind of yeah, save yourself some time. Do you, do you ever have days where you knock out like 10 of these and then just take a break? <laughs> that's a, that's a no. little difficult. Because <laughs> like the way I do it is I, I try to look at the image just mm -hmm. on its own and I develop everything within the image. I don't um, like I don't do the thing that David Ariev does, which is create an entire scene and then just puts cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I always try to like do it's like a painting almost. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spend a lot of time on that one image. And if at some point I decide to animate it, I will kind of extend it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, so that when the camera moves left and right, it has things to look at as, instead of just uh, blank space, which is actually what's there um, from just uh, if you do it directly to the camera, it, there's only so many things you have to put in the frame. Yeah. And so once you animate it, you kind of have to like, you know, compensate for the extra range yeah. of motion. So, um, so you, you mentioned something that um, uh, we, we kind of talked a little bit already about like chasing trends versus doing, um, you know, just things that you're personally interested in. Uh, but you said something that I think is interesting that clearly you are also being strategic about what things you choose to work on because you're, you're trying to find things that maybe already have, um, you know, a little bit of a built in audience or some built in interest already. Um, mm -hmm. which I think is really smart. Do you want to talk about that a little bit or uh, kind of what you do to figure that out or the combination of that versus your interests? Yeah. So I kind of stumbled on this. I didn't, if I had known this when I first started like doing stuff on Instagram, I probably would have been a lot uh, further along in terms <laughs> of like, uh, fans and stuff. But uh, what I found out is that if you make things that kind of uh, tap into an existing fan base, so like Doom, um, people will like people who are interested in Doom will see it, and mm -hmm. if it's good, they will then like it and engage with you. Uh, same thing with Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, I I I I just happen to be a huge fan of it. Like I've been following it for years. Uh, I, I'm even reading the like the books that are intended to be for like young adults, but <laughs> they're like horrifying and they really appeal to me. But um, so I was like, I'm just going to make this because um, I feel really compelled to. And and I didn't realize how much um, the fans would actually like really in, enjoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, so as soon as I made uh, the, the one with the guy coming out of the ball pit, um, like on Reddit and Instagram and also TikTok, it kind of just took a life of its own and people were just like, do more, do more. And I was just like, whoa, I, I was not expecting this. Like, I, I thought I was like the only person who liked Five Nights. <laughs> it turns out there's just like this huge horde of people who like it. And so by tapping into that, it definitely brings more people and more attention to you. And it kind of, you know, it, it also kind of works as a Trojan horse of sorts because uh, you're, you're kind of like luring them in with like this cool work that relates to their interests. But if they scroll down a little bit more, they'll find other things that are more like original and they'll, if they like your style, they'll stick around. So cool. 
Do you do you feel like you're getting uh, actual work out of that stuff as well, or is it kind of like a little bit of a dual purpose thing where you can you can do a thing that is um, you know liked already, and you get kind of fans and followers, and then also that's generating you know cool stuff that you like anyway that goes to your reel, or do you feel like there's some intersection between that? Does that question make sense? I feel like I got a little <laughs> tangenty. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, the thing that I would say, uh, when it comes to like work with it, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I noticed is that when you're posting stuff that you're really like passionate about, uh, you tend to put a lot of like care and your strengths really come out, um, in those images. And so when people are looking at your work, um, even if they're trying to hire you for like a corporate gig, you know, like, oh, we need, we're coming out with a TV. We need, we need like cool, like shots and stuff. Um. But if you show that you are very strong at lighting, texturing, like compositing, all that stuff, and this is something that you do on your own, um, they they feel a lot more comfortable paying you actual money to do something for them, even if it's not like scary or or like relates anything at all to the stuff that you're putting out. They know that, you know, like they know what your capabilities are mm -hmm. and how good you can be. Um, and so, yeah, if, you, if this is what you do on your own, like. You know, you got a little extra motivation to do even more uh, for their project. So awesome, well said. Um, I'm looking at a couple of the questions that have been coming in here. Um, so I see one that uh, might be helpful. Someone is asking, where is a good place to start learning about dynamics and simulations? Um, I'm pretty sure Grayscale Gorilla has some of those. Um, yeah, I, I would just. Google or uh, like on YouTube, there's like a pretty big uh, community of tutorials there that I would um, just check out. Like it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I think also EJ has mm -hmm. a lot of like on soft body and stuff. Um, there's a if you're in if they have like X particles, uh, there's a couple of tutorials on uh, I think on Vimeo is from this guy. I forget his name, uh, but he does a lot of like liquid stuff and it kind of teaches you a lot more of like the uh, the engine behind the scenes on how it works. And so it shows you like, uh, if you want to like give yourself really good, like, uh, simulations, you can go into the, to the expert tab and kind of increase like the sub steps and it gives you a lot smoother animations. But yeah, like I mentioned with this guy, like it was all default settings. So it, you can get going really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a cinema user, but, uh, you know, I've done a lot of particle generator work and, you know, been, running various physics simulations for a long time. I mean, I totally, I feel like I got what you were doing and it probably took me, take me some work to figure out exactly how to do it. But like, uh, I, I understood definitely what was going on in there. Um, <laughs> we have another one here. It's kind of the perennial 3d question. Uh, wanted to kind of get, um, some, uh, some of your opinion about these third party renders uh, you mentioned a couple of them already. Um, do you have any that you prefer or prefer for different things or any opinions to add to that uh, ever burning debate? It's like, how do I say it? Without, <laughs> you know, uh, so what I would say is I started out in Octane. Um, I thought it was really, really cool for uh, the time, especially because mm -hmm. I started out in 2015 using it and seeing being able to like produce animations a lot faster than just a standard render. Even though the computer I was using had like really awesome specs, uh, it still took a really long time to render certain things. And so bringing in Octane was really cool to you know figure out and use. Uh, but yeah, kind of Octane you know has its uh, strengths and it does do a lot of really cool things. But when it comes to uh, transitioning from like standard render and physical to a third party engine, I think the transition is a little bit more seamless when you use Redshift. And so I use Redshift as my preferred render right now. Um, and it feels very much like I'm using physical, but it uses the GPU to render. And maybe some people don't agree with that. I don't know. But uh, I found it to be very intuitive uh, to work with because like um, in order to do like, for example, um, in Cinema 4D, when you have lights, you can tell a light to not affect an object and you just go to the project tab you say exclude and then that's it in octane you have to kind of put in a, like a tag you have to then set it to like a light uh number and then you have to then go into the light 
set that thing to not affect this number, and then then it doesn't affect it. And it and they added that not that long ago, and so for a really long time it it just wasn't a feature. Whereas Redshift, it was there the moment they created it. So, and for me, I use that a lot, and it's very useful for me uh, to, especially for like if you're doing any product shots or just want to create like an effect that uh, you can't do in with realism. Uh, that for me was definitely helpful. Uh, but I would say that both render engines are awesome. I've never used Arnold or anything, so I can't really say anything about mm -hmm. that. But both Redshift and uh, Octane, they definitely uh, uh, were useful to me uh, for different reasons. Uh, but I find Redshift currently to be uh, a lot more useful for what I do. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people like I don't know they get tied up in stuff like that because they feel like one of them is a is a magic button or something and ultimately like they're all just different ways to do the thing and if you don't know how to do the thing it doesn't really matter which magic button you think you're using because it's not gonna just poof make all your stuff look amazing just because you use this one tool right yeah yeah, it's not the tool, it's the artist, yeah. you know. And, like, there's people out there who still use physical and standard, and they come up with, like, some really cool stuff. And and it's funny reading, like, the comments in the, and where people are like, what render engine did you... And then they're like, this is physical. And they're like, what? <laughs> it's almost like magic to them that yeah. they were able to produce something good in the standard. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about... Um... Uh, you, you doing every days and uh, you mentioned how those really like help you hone in your process and, and get faster and stuff. Uh, we have another question here that, um, you know, you've been doing a lot of tutorials and some articles and stuff for School of Motion lately. And obviously you've got um, other tutorials that uh, are, are on your site and did your thing for SIGGRAPH and whatever. Do you feel like doing um, teaching stuff, uh, do you feel like that helps you solidify your own knowledge? Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because when you when you're teaching people, you kind of have to know what you're talking about. So uh, before I give any sort of like technical explanation for something, I always have to do it first mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that I'm not just giving them a bunch of. Uh, you want to make so, sure you know what you're talking about if you're gonna <laughs> be telling other people. Yeah. So yeah. So I just want to make sure that you know I'm not leading them to like some dead end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you kind of have to like know uh, know what you're saying, but also. When you're like critiquing people's work or anything like that, uh, if you're going to be talking about like theory or composition and stuff, you also have to kind of solidify your understanding of that as well. Uh, otherwise, you know, you might just, you know, it, it, some people will call you out, and if you put in wrong information, you'll see it really quickly in the comment yeah. section, and and that's and you know, it's a little embarrassing when you like give false information. Um, and so whenever that happens, like there was one issue where I had a um, like this figure eight and it was kind of looking really weird. The octopus thing. And I didn't thing. know how to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I didn't know how to fix this one area. And then in the comments, somebody was like, yeah, you just have to take this thing. And I was like, dang it. And so I just like <laughs> in the description was like, hey, guys, make sure you do this. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, it's a good example, too. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're always going to be learning new stuff and nobody knows everything. But um, definitely like it makes you step back and think about like how to explain the thing step by step. And sometimes you realize like, oh, I've just kind of been doing this thing. and I never thought about why that's the solution. And then you look into it and and sometimes find a better way. I don't know. Um, yeah. I feel like that's maybe a good lead into uh, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, you've been a teaching assistant for a, a couple of school of motion courses. Um, just sort of any thoughts about like uh, being a TA or the benefits that you've seen from doing that? Yeah, so I would say that uh, when I first started, I was very nervous in front of a camera mm -hmm. uh, because you have to do those um, every Wednesday. You have to release a, a video where you do a video critique. And when you when I see like those first ones that I did, I was like super nervous. Um, I deleted all of mine kind of... early ones. <laughs> yeah, and like they're they're rough, but. Uh, you kind of get better at in front of a camera and stuff, and it kind of makes you a little bit more um, confident to do like tutorials mm -hmm. and stuff. But when it comes to like critiquing people's work, uh, you kind of know what to look for, and and then eventually you kind of realize like why that thing works uh, works or why it doesn't, and so you can kind of lead them to you know figure it out. And you know you can kind of get technical with them, but a lot of the times they're kind of you know they're kind of starting out, so you don't want to like bombard them with too much. Um, so you kind of have to like find ways to tell them how to do the thing better, 
but in a very simplified way and also explain why it's uh, better to do it this way mm -hmm. uh, without too much too much uh, yapping. Um, <laughs> and so I think that really helped me out uh, at first and also kind of trained my eye um, mm -hmm. on lighting, like design, aesthetic and stuff. Uh, you know, like one thing that I kind of push a lot on the students is making sure that their values are correct. So I'm just like, yo, man, like this thing is like really bright and it draws your eye over here. Like you don't you want them to, you know, look at the product that you have in front of you. So definitely kind of try to lead it there. And the best way to do it is with light. And so trying to kind of give them a little bit of like hints in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. And but it also ends up helping my work because I now am like hypercritical of my own compositions yeah. and lights and all that. Yeah, uh, definitely. I found that like, um, you, you know, you don't have to be a TA to do this, but. Uh, critiquing other people's work, uh, especially if you're doing it regularly, is such a great way to start seeing, the, especially the common things that people like skip all the time. Um, and then it starts giving you that eye to see those things in your own work. Um, and, it, you know, I, I feel like being a TA is uh, sort of like stealth training to become a creative director. Because you have to figure out how to communicate those things in, you know, nice, constructive ways. But also, most of the time, you're trying to, like, point out a thing that could be improved. But, um, you know, there, there are some things that have sort of like a, an easy, like, A, B sort of solution. But um, most of the time, it's like, hey, this is a thing that could be improved. Here's maybe a suggestion. But kind of leaving it to you to to take the next step there. Um, so I think it's, a, it's really good to... Yeah, get in that mode of pointing things out, but not necessarily telling people exactly what to do, um, mm -hmm. but helping them take that next step. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with the creative director thing. That was one thing that kind of came to mind was like, yeah, you kind of feel like you're, you know, being a creative director, you're kind of guiding all your artists to, you know, like if you were a, in, in a client, and this project that they're working on is for, you know, like Coke or something like you're going to give them the notes that you would give an, an artist, a junior artist, uh, so that the client is happy. So, yeah. Um, so man, it's, uh, it's like five minutes to the end of the hour already. <laughs> Time flies so much. So, uh, you know, I told you before we started, uh, that we would talk about horror movies for a minute. So let's fit in a little bit of time to talk about horror movies. Cause you wanted to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so recently I watched uh, Hereditary and um, Midsummer, and you know normally I watch horror movies because they're like they're I don't know they're fun to watch mm -hmm. and they have kind of like you know they have cool gore effects and whatever, or sometimes they're cheesy whatever. But I watched these two, uh, both, uh, one in the middle of the night, the other one not so much in the middle, of the night. and those things you know horrified me. I was just like, man, these these things are like actual like horror, and. It really tripped me out. I, I keep thinking about it, and so I wanted to like chat with somebody. <laughs> do those? Um, uh, d do you watch one that uh, like leads you directly into like inspiring some of your you know your, your next uh, grid of of personal projects or anything? Uh, well, yeah. So uh, the thing that I'm currently working on, what uh, I posted a still of it yesterday, mm -hmm. which is people on like these um, sheet ghosts. Yeah, and. Yeah, I kind of, I don't know, like when you see the animation of it, it's, you know, it's like somebody answers the door thinking it's a trick or treat and then they don't see anything. They find like a knife on the, in front of them and then they look up and then it appears and then like the lights flicker and the more of them appear and appear and then like eventually invite his home and it ends. <laughs> and so I was just like, I think maybe this might be uh, getting influenced a little bit by those movies. <laughs> Because like that one actually seems scary. Like like the Five Nights at Freddy's things, like they might be creepy or kind They're of like, like fun, scary. kind of weird things. Yeah. Like this one might actually be you know, scary. Like people might actually be like, whoa, <laughs> like maybe maybe tone down. <laughs> and so yeah, so maybe it is a little bit. Well, I uh, uh, it looks like I probably have the house to myself this weekend because my family's going to the mm -hmm. lake. So maybe I'll finally get some time to watch horror movies that. I don't have to start at like midnight, which is not really when I want to start a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would definitely recommend don't watch Hereditary in the middle of the night no, because <laughs> it's a lot, there's a lot of scenes where there's people in darkness and you can barely see them and they're there for like 
the entire shot and you don't notice it until like maybe at the end and you're like how long were they there and so yeah then you start you stand up and it's dark in your house and you're just like yeah this is, this is a bad idea <laughs> um okay so uh we got to start kind of bringing this thing in for a landing here uh but there was one question that i really liked oh uh here's another one that just popped up what's your favorite horror let's they didn't specify like uh, thing so you could say movie game whatever and why okay uh let's see i'm a big fan of the thing um i like the uh the gore effects on it mm -hmm. like the creature effects are just like really good um i'm really i'm really bummed out uh, because they made a prequel to it yeah and it was supposed to be you know also like kind of like that but then they decided to do it all in cg and it looks really weird uh, so I'm really bummed out about that, but I, that movie alone was it's probably one of the better like um, Because it's not just a bunch of dumb people running up stairs when they should be running out of the house <laughs> Like these, these people are actually smart and they're actually like thinking through everything But it's still like it. They still kind of get yeah. outsmarted by the by the creature and Yeah, I would say that one and it's another one also like, you know slasher films. So like scream Freddy Krueger um, and not not so much Jason, which mm -hmm. might make some people mad. Uh, but yeah, I do like uh, I do like those films because I like the idea of the final girl, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know like the girl who's a virgin, whatever. And like the mythology behind it is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think people accidentally created it, so it's like um, it's always if you watch this movie, it's called Behind the Mask: uh, the The Rise of Leslie Vernon and whatever. He kind of breaks it down really interesting. Uh, where it talks about it's not necessarily about the killer. It's about the rebirth of the final girl So she's innocent, but then at a certain point she comes out and kills the the, mm -hmm. the killer and that's sort of her rebirth everything that was holding her back You know gets gets kind of burned away and she now is on the same level as the killer and I find that really like really interesting uh, but most people kind of just they just do it uh, to kill a bunch of teenagers. But I just found that <laughs> mythology to be really cool. Well, I do enjoy the thought behind that stuff. Uh, my answer to this question would probably be Alien, which, um, mm. you know, there's obviously a lot of subtext that you could read into those movies um, as well. And uh, I mean, I tend to like sci-fi horror like that because good sci-fi, too, is also just a way to tell a story in a you know different mm. environment. But um, yeah, the... Uh, all kinds of good, like creepy, claustrophobic uh, stuff. And did you uh, ever play the game? Uh, I've played some of them. Um, yeah, I, I've tried to start. Uh, what is it? Alien Isolation. I've started it a couple times. Never quite got into it. But I also try to get away <laughs> yeah. from my computer sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, okay. One last question for you, uh, and then I'm going to do my wrap up stuff. What do you see as the next step in your career or what are your next goals? Um, yeah, well, okay. So the thing that I would uh, ultimately like to do is transition from doing client work uh, to doing more education. Um, I really enjoy teaching people. And so my tutorials are kind of like, we're kind of my baby steps mm -hmm. into trying to, uh, you know, uh, be able to like speak to the camera, be able to come up with content that people can enjoy. Uh, and so that's something that I'm kind of like leaning a lot towards uh, every time I make like a new series of stuff I always think of how I can turn it into a tutorial or like what things that are important in that that I can share to other people And so yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm work currently working on doing the five nights of Fridays like mm -hmm. the ball pit uh, So that people can kind of see like my process behind that um, And then you know take it see what else I can produce with it but ultimately that would be my main goal is just doing education rather than do it, just constantly trying to find clients. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, that's really cool. It feels like you're well on your way. And uh, uh, I definitely kind of took, you know, sort of stumbled into that same path myself. So um, <laughs> I, I guess I endorse it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I still don't feel like I have a plan, just sort of taking it as it comes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, next week, uh, I'm going to be back with another live stream, and we're going to have Jonathan Winbush on. So uh, we're going to, again, have uh, a really smart person who knows a lot about a thing that I know almost nothing about. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, and uh, if you are a fan of 3D things, I will say stay tuned for later in this month because we might have um, some more really cool stuff coming up. Uh, I think you actually mentioned... Uh, 
some of the people that are going to be on. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, the School of Motion scholarship uh, that has happened a couple times in the past, um, that is something that uh, if you are interested in applying for that again, stay tuned this next week. We've got some uh, really interesting stuff coming up for you. Um, so, uh, Luis, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Um, we ended up not uh, doing any spooky bits during the show, <laughs> aside from my very smooth intro. But uh, scary good. Yeah. Do you have any spooky puns to take us out? I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not very good at puns. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I burned all of mine trying to come up with the like description for this thing. <laughs> I definitely uh, had to open up some old like Tales from the Crypt intros to like get in the right mindset. I like the uh, skeleton of mm -hmm, tips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I, I did uh, outsource a little bit of this to the rest of the School of Motion team, who are very <laughs> uh, pun savvy. I will say. Um, okay, well, I feel like we got to wrap this thing up. Uh, although we could probably do this for another hour, but uh, I know we <laughs> we all have things to get to. So. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone for watching. Uh, Luis, thank you so much for you know talking with us and, and showing us some behind the scenes stuff from your project and uh, coming on. And uh, it was great getting to hang out with you. Yeah, that was fun too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, bye. And uh, oh, one last very important thing before we go. Please vote. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't make that be scary too. Uh, okay. <laughs> End of the show. Bye. Yeah.